We're going to turn again this week to Paul's writings to the church in Ephesus and his writing to his protege, Timothy. And we're going to let and ask God's word to teach us about how we live as men and women in our homes and in the church. Would you stand with me, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to begin reading in verse 15 <clears throat> and finish in verse 21. So again, stand with me, Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that are soft to your touch so that we might grow as men and as women and as children into your image, Jesus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, the title for today's sermon is is simply Complimentary at Home and at church. Complimentary at home and church. And that really divides our passages here. We're going to be in Ephesians and then in Timothy. We're going to see the the home in Ephesians and the church in Timothy. Our goal today is exegesis, not eisegesis. Now, those are nerdy words, but I want to remind us of that as I have been, I think, consistently through this, this series that how we read God's word really says a lot about what we believe about God. And it really determines a sobering amount of of, 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 of concerns that I could raise right now, but I'll, I'll get on a, a, a tangent there. So let me define exegesis as the following. And this is thanks to the pocket dictionary of theological terms. Exegesis literally means, quote, drawing meaning out of a text. So in our context, it's the Bible. We want to draw meaning out of it. We don't want to eisegete, which is to read meaning into it. And the key here is the prefaces. Uh, X out of ice into. Okay? As evangelicals, we must be a people who draw meaning out of God's word rather than reading our thoughts into it. We submit ourselves to God's word under his authority and let him speak to us rather than telling him what we believe about him to be true or not to be true. Gender at home. Ephesians 5. We just read that, so it's fresh in your mind. Notice Paul's warning right off the bat. Look carefully then how you walk. Look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Notice, he he mentions things here that are familiar and and is just as important to us today as they were back in the first century. Wisdom is in short account now and it was back then, friends. Two, time is fleeting. We've got to figure out how to make the best use of it. And the days are evil. They're still evil. There's always evil. And, And the more news we read, the more discouraging it gets. And the days seem to slip away from us. Time slips away from us. All of those things are true. Paul then says, look, don't don't be foolish. Know the will of God. And don't get drunk on wine, but get drunk or full of the Spirit. And then he he encourages the the, the people to address each other in Scripture, in psalms and, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with our hearts. Talk about the good stuff. Talk about what God is doing in your life. Share your testimonies with each other, not only of your salvation, but of what he's done this week, this day, this hour. And giving thanks to God for everything, even the hard stuff, even the hard stuff. You don't know this, but I just tried to record this. I thought I had recorded this sermon successfully and it did not record. So this is my take too. And I give thanks to God. He has a purpose that is greater than mine for uh, causing me to do this a second time. Last but not least, in fact, most important is his words here in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So he says all of that to say, submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, what does that mean? What does submitting to one another actually look like? Well, friends, we see it here applied to women, to wives particularly, and to husbands. 
So Paul is, is saying we submit to each other in appropriate ways. And I'm going to show you what I mean by applying it to the most common denominator in the church. And that is the, 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 the home, the, the marriage. And so Paul begins then to flesh this out. Starting with wives, first he gives three verses here. And for the husbands, he gives a truckload. Okay, Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Submit to your own husbands, not somebody else's. And notice the caveat, as unto the Lord. So immediately, if you're thinking of exceptions regarding abuse, no, 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 that's not unto the Lord. A, a, a husband cannot ask you to do evil, embezzle money, or do some, some horrible, perverse things. Or, or he cannot uh, beat you physically and call it good. You must submit yourself to your husbands, but unto the Lord. So those horrible exceptions, and, and, and that's why we have VIP here, sisters. You need help? Go, to, go get help. Talk to Carmen here. Get help. Talk to one of the pastors. Police, get help. But the calling here in the general functional home and marriage is wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. Now, <clears throat> he unpacks this a little more. There is a hierarchy here. For the husband is the head of the wife. Okay? And there's no other way to really translate this. Uh, other commentators have tried to get around this because they don't like the, the teaching of the scripture here, but it's clearly head. There's no other way to work it. Head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. So the wife submits to the husband. The husband is the head and the head of the husband is Jesus. So husbands are not God. They're not dictators. That They don't rule the world. They're not going to judge it. They will be under God the Father's judgment for their love or lack thereof, their leadership or lack thereof of their wives. Now, sisters, some of us are tempted and some very popular recent female writers have basically said, you know, this isn't really scripture or commandment here. This is just Paul. This is like his aside. This isn't actual scripture. And that's just a horribly dangerous and unorthodox, frankly, heretical view of scripture. Don't read people who are espousing that. They're dismissing scripture. They're picking and choosing what is God's word and what is man's word. That, that's, not, that's not an option in our faith. It's either all God's word or it's none of God's word. And that Paul is speaking God's word as an apostle, as one of the 12 appointed, 13 technically, appointed to be his messengers, Judas dies. Um, is, is something that Peter himself believes. 2 Peter 3, uh, 15 through 17. Peter's talking about how difficult some of the Paul's writings are and how he's hard to understand. But notice what he says here. Uh, in, it's either 16 or 17. I got to find it here. He, he says this. Um, there are some things in them that is Paul's writings that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. In other words, they dismiss Paul's scriptures just as much as they do the other scriptures. Don't go there with them. And don't go there, sisters, especially sisters with popular uh, feminist, quote, Christian writers. Okay? Paul's word here is God's word. God, it can work to preach his word through people. He's been doing it for centuries, for millennia. So wives, submit to your husbands. Sisters, I know this is hard. Submission is not easy. Submission is defined by yielding to another's authority. In our day and age, we are told to not do that. We are told to uh, assert our authority, to assert our, our independence, etc. Sisters, that is not biblical. And it is causing problems in your life and in your faith that maybe just now you're starting to realize. Or over the next months and years, as you choose to submit to your husband, you will see how much God is blessing you and how much problems you had caused by not submitting. The, the unto the Lord, again, is, the, is, a, is a key caveat here. And husbands cannot call wives to be uh, to doing evil, <clears throat> but they are to be the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. What a standard. And we're going to see that, men, in a little bit. So don't fall asleep here. You're going to get called to account and given a great, great charge. Christ is the head. The husband is the head of the wife. <clears throat> and the wives are to submit. Um, so sisters, what does that look like? Okay. Some of you have frankly, uh, more assertiveness than your husband. Some of you have gifts that tend to be more leader-like than others. This isn't about gifting. This isn't about skill sets. 
This isn't uh, about nature nurture, so to speak. This is about calling. This is about that God has, has created and ordained something that is irreversible. So one of my good friends, uh, his wife was certainly more authoritarian in her, in her personality than he was, but they figured out how to, how to work that out for him to lead and her to submit. She wasn't a doormat. Very brilliant woman, frankly. Um, but they figured out how to make that relationship work. You too can do that, sisters. Okay? So don't try to lawyer this. Don't look for loopholes. Don't look for imperfections in your husband. Look for ways to pray for your husband and submit to Jesus. All right, I think you get it, at least for now. You have questions, fire them off. We'll work through them in some subsequent videos, Lord willing. Ephesians 5.25 now turns to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, why does Jesus start with love? Why does Paul start with love here, I should say? Jesus is writing through Paul, but you get my point. Why love? Well, brothers, frankly, it's not something we're always strong in. If I'm angry with my wife, the first thing I do is remove love. I'm angry. I'm harsh. I'm, I'm bitter. I'm, I'm frustrated. I lash out. It's not love. It's the opposite. And in, in the book and series and in, in, in marriage series called Love and Respect, Allison and I went through that years ago, I think Emmer, uh, Egerich, Dr. Egerich, has a great point here. He notices what he calls a crazy cycle. Husbands, when they're frustrated with their wives and sinning against them, tend to remove love. Wives, when they're frustrated and wanting to sin against their husbands, they remove respect. And so you get this crazy cycle where he doesn't love and she doesn't respect, and it just goes around and around like a tornado of destruction just awful. It's the crazy cycle. He's not loving. She's disrespectful. And man, brothers and sisters, can you see it? It's a pattern in your marriage. It's been there. If you've been married for any number of days, you've seen it. And brothers, that's why we're called husbands to love our wives first and foremost. And notice the example. Like Jesus, that's the highest bar possible. And there's no excuses. Love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. All right, so Paul's kind of zipping into metaphors here, but essentially he's, he's reminding us of what we know from, from Jesus' teaching in the Gospels that marriage is not ultimate in the human sense, one man, one woman, but rather it's a great working out of the ultimate marriage between Christ, the groom, and the bride, his church. So, husbands, we are to love our wives by preparing them to be with Jesus for eternity, equipping, washing them in the word, uh, presenting them without 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 flaw, without without spot or wrinkle. They are to be beautiful and holy. And it is our labor in our marriage to help them be that. To labor for the best of them spiritually, to pour into them, to care for them, to nurture them, to encourage them, to pray for them, to, to, to spend our lives loving our wives in that way. So how's it going? Sobering, isn't it? I'm certainly not perfect in this. Ask my wife. What comes to your mind right now? Where are you falling short? Write it down. Bring it to another brother who's older and wiser and ask him for help. Is it that you just don't know God's word because you're not studying it? Okay. Maybe you just don't know how to study God's word. Maybe reading is hard. Maybe you have a, a disability, dyslexia. Fine. Uh, audio books, audio Bibles are great apps. There are ways, brothers. Uh, I don't want to hear an excuse, nor does God. He's not going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You just had a hard time reading and gave up on it. Way to go. Come on. So, some of you brothers can tackle engine blocks and the toughest mechanical repairs, that, and you, you can't sit down and read God's word? That's not a good excuse. It's not an excuse. That's going to hold up in God's court. So get to know God's word, dig in deep, feast so you can feed your wife and therefore feed your children. And it's not her job, it's your job. She'll partner along with you and many of, your, many of our, our brothers, our wives are incredible teachers of God's word to our kids. But they're doing it and they need to be doing it under your leadership and you need to be a part of that, okay? So brothers, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. <clears throat> Notice, 
Uh, some of us brothers, frankly, um, don't <laughs> just, just are not kind to our wives. Some of us live with our wives as if we hate them. And, and this is what Paul's unpacking perhaps here and, and later in 28 and 29. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. Just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. So, brothers, you and I cannot hate our wives. Oh, we have our struggles. We have our hard times, but we are not allowed that. We are not allowed that, that type of attitude. We must love them and cherish them and nourish them. Yeah, she may have hurt you. She may have said some things that are harsh. But brothers, that doesn't mean we get to go 50%. We got to go 100%. And that's one of the things I want to just unpack real quick. My wife and I have a video of our wedding, which is super, you know, 90s and kind of dorky in that way. But there's a song in there. It's a country song. The idea is uh, you start walking my way and I'll start walking yours and we'll meet in the middle under this old Georgia pine. And, you're right. and the idea is I'll go 50, you go 50. That's not biblical. <laughs> it's just not biblical. And that's a way to get into marriage counseling quick. You got to go this much and then I'll go this much. Nope. Did Jesus approach our salvation that way? No, he came all the way. He loved us while we were still sinners. You and I, brothers, husbands, wives, we've got to love each other 100%. We've got to work on this marriage 100%, whether the other spouse is given 10 or 5 or 0 for that moment. Okay? Brothers, we can't hate our wives. We can't despise them. We have to nourish and cherish them. They're a gift, and it's your calling. And you don't have an excuse. So don't be bad-mouthing your wives. Love them. Now, Paul goes back to Genesis. So this isn't Paul's opinion. This isn't just some, some uh, aside, or like I give as preachers sometimes, just kind of get off on a tangent. Paul's saying, I I'm commanding you men and women to do this, to, to, to love each other in complimentary ways, for the husband to lead and for the wife to submit, because, hey, guess what? It's in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. So Paul says to the husband, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So you see that crazy cycle that Emmerich was talking about, or Egerich, excuse me, it's right there too. Brothers, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. And know that this is part of God's plan for you since before the fall in creation. Now, we could get to children, but we don't have time for that right now. And this is really about complementary natures between male and female, and particularly in the, in, the, in the home here for us adults. So, sorry kids, we'll get to you later. But the short, of it, the short answer there is uh, honor your parents. Listen to them. And it will go well with you. It's the first commandment with a blessing. The fifth commandment. Um, let's skip now to, if we're complementary at home, male and female. There are differences and they are God-given and they're glorious and neither devalue, but both are equally valuable. Um, then there's also differences or complementary natures in the church. First Timothy chapter two, turn there with me. Verse eight is where we're going to start putting it in context. This is Paul's first letter to Timothy. He's pouring out a lot of ministry wisdom. He's left Timothy in Ephesus to, to pastor there, to be the, the head elder or shepherd there of that church. And he's, he's been giving him a lot of counsel on different things. And now he's turned to Sunday service, the worship service, if you will, at that time. Looked different than ours today, but the same, the same idea is here. And, and he's first going to talk to the men now, not the women. And then he's going to talk to the women. So first, verse 8, notice what he says. I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Okay. Of all the things Paul could have said. He talks about men and their anger. Sound familiar, brothers? Yeah. It's a problem, not just for husbands, just for men in general. And we're good at quarreling, aren't we? He's not talking here about fisticuffs, although that is true. But here he's talking about putting each other down, arguing, and that type of thing. So instead of using our hands, Paul says, to, to, for anger and quarreling and arguing back and forth, let us lift our hands in prayer. 
So Baptist, it's okay. You can lift your hands to pray. It's all right. It's all good. Okay. You can get full charismatic if you want. Okay. Or you don't have to lift your hands at all. The point is prayer, not what you do with your hands, y'all. Right. Okay. So Paul then says, likewise, women. Now, the likewise means Paul's going to argue in the same way. He's going he's to essentially say, don't do this for the men quarreling and arguing and being angry. Do this. Pray. Prayer is holy. That other stuff is sinful. Now, for the women, he's going to say, likewise, I want you to put off this bad stuff and put on this good stuff. Ironically, it's about modesty and submissiveness. So he's actually going to ask them to put on more, if you will, to cover more and to submit. So let, let's look at that in, in detail now. Likewise, also, verse 9, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness, and we, and we can go on with that, but let's start with modesty first. Not a popular topic, I know. But notice, it's a topic of the heart. Because what does he say? Uh, adorn yourselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. It, there's something in a woman's heart at times that wants to flaunt, to, to show, to attract, and therefore lacks self-control. Modesty, therefore, is the employment of self-control to cover what the world says you should show off. Now, let's just pause there. Can you think of any movie recently, any song recently, any display of, of uh, famous women that shows modesty? In other words, a lot of skin covered as opposed to very little. Boy, the examples are few and far between, aren't they, sisters? I mean, if we were just to do a study of, of clothing over the, over the generations, over the past hundred years, it would be immediately obvious. We're just showing more and more and more. We are an exhibitionist society. It's true on social media. Women just share and bear on social media and we're doing it with our clothing. Now, Paul doesn't get into measuring skirt lengths. He doesn't, he gets into some details. They're examples. They're not, they're not bound in, in concrete here. He's trying to give examples in the first century context in, in a culture totally different than ours. But still the same heart issue applies. How much are you bearing? Are you showing self-control or not? Are you listening to the world? Are you listening to the Lord on this issue? I can't counsel you in this well. I'm a man. But God's word can, obviously. And God's word encourages you, older women, to counsel the younger women on this very issue. Look with me at Titus chapter 2. Older women, Titus chapter 2, verse 3. And by the way, older here is, is generic. There is always somebody older than you unless you're 90, okay? And then therefore somebody younger than you. So again, it doesn't matter really what your age is here. There are older women who can help the younger women. The 40-year-old helping the 20-year-old, the 60-year-old helping the 40-year-old, right, etc. You get my idea. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. So younger women, find some older sisters who are not prone to slander and gossip and don't hit the bottle, okay? Find some women who are godly and ask them for wisdom on modesty if you're struggling with what should I wear, what shouldn't I? Or what should my, how do I approach this with my junior high uh, daughter going through puberty? Who's, who's struggling with security and, and, and body image and all the things that are getting thrown at her. And by the way, if we could, church, oh, man, if we could just chuck our, our smartphones in the, in, the, in the river as soon as kids get to, to junior high, it'd be a lot better for the, for the girls. The, 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 de the depression rates go up astronomically because of smartphones with young women. Yeah, and I don't, I can forward an article on this at a later point. I think I already have, but, but that's just another wisdom issue right there. O older women, help your younger women, younger moms navigate uh, technology. I digress. So <clears throat> it's a hard issue. Um, modesty 
but it is not an option. Modesty is biblical. We, we see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the Song of Solomon. Uh, we, we see it <clears throat> when Abraham, Isaac, Isaac is, is meeting his bride-to-be for the first time, and she veils herself. That didn't have to be recorded, but it was, because it was important. Modesty is important, sisters. Leave room for the imagination. Only your husband gets to see the true beauty of your body. It's not for anybody else's consumption. And notice, it's not because, dear sisters, you should, you know, worry about how men might lust after you. I mean, that, that would be a kind consideration. I wouldn't want to cause any woman to stumble in a different area of life. They're not going to stumble with lust over me, but they're going to stumble over something. I wouldn't want to, 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 to tempt that or to, to, to put something out there that might cause them to. So that's, but that's not Paul's point here. As Paul, his point is about your own self-control, about your own heart, your own motivations. N- not so much about, about weaker men who tend to lust a lot. Okay. Then, then he goes on to an even less popular topic. If modesty was unpopular in these days of flaunt it when you got it, um, Paul says, hey, let a woman learn quietly, verse 11, with all submissiveness. There's that, there's that word again. I do not permit a woman, he's not talking to wives here, by the way, he's talking to women. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. All right, so let's unpack it. Let's unpack it. What is, what is Paul saying here? In, in short, what he's been saying since Genesis, what God's been saying since Genesis 1 and 2, God made Adam first to lead to teach, to name, to work, to provide, to protect, etc. He gave him from his own flesh a beautiful wife, Eve, to help him in those labors, to come alongside him, the beautiful alto to his tenor, the harmony to his, his lead melody. She is not the pianist in the background while he's the soloist. It's the duet, friends. Okay? They're up there together. Intimately, it's like dancing. You can't do country couples dancing, or anything for that matter, and both try to lead. You're going to kill somebody. Somebody's got to lead. Somebody's got to respond and follow. Okay? And the man's role, not because of gifting again, but because of calling, is to teach and to have that authority in the church. And the wife, or the woman, excuse me, is to um, remain quiet and submit. So you can imagine in a culture where the Greek women were treated like, in some ways, trash, okay, as superior, in, inferior citizens, okay, um, that there's been an overreaction here. In other words, that they're, they're getting their value back that God gave them in creation because they're reading scriptures and, and seeing how Jesus treated women. And wow, it's amazing. Um, and they're overreacting because they believe what feminists today would believe, I think, or egalitarians at least would believe that you got to have equal roles to be equally valued. And that's just not what the scriptures teach. So there's an overreaction, an overcompensation from the, the well, probably what they suffered before. And it's, the pendulum just swung too far. So Paul's making a correction. He's like, the, the authority and the teaching, that, that leadership is, is, is given to men. Again, it's not, it's not because they're gifting per se. It's because of God's calling on their lives. And women, you are called to submit to that and listen <clears throat> and to learn. Uh, in some religions, the women aren't even allowed to learn, by the way. They really are treated as second-hand citizens. I mean, in Islam, uh, and this is not in the Quran necessarily, I believe this is in the surahs, but uh, the man's heaven is a woman's hell. Because the, 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 the idea of a man's heaven is women as, as sexual slaves. Uh, there's no depiction of that profane idea of, of a woman as a piece of meat here in Scripture? No. Both men and women are learning and growing under the teaching of God's Word. There's just a, a, a specific role for the men to play and a role for the women to play. No less value. So a woman should not teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she should remain quiet in that respect, in the teaching aspect, is what he's saying there in context. Not just always be quiet. That's not the point. And we saw that last week in Ephesians. We saw that the four teaching roles gifted to the church are reserved for men. Apostle, prophet, um, evangelist, and elder, uh, elder teacher. Okay? And we saw that the role of elder is limited 
to men. It is not open to women. 1 Timothy 3, the next chapter over. Titus chapter 1. Nothing new here because Paul knows his scriptures and he goes back again to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. In chapter 3 of Genesis, and Adam, verse 14, was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So again, this is not Paul's opinion. This is not some bizarre uh, um, historical event where there's some crazy women pastors who are teaching heresy. That, that's not anywhere provable in Timothy or Ephesians or the book of Acts. And even if that were the case, even if there were some uh, a heretical uh, female pastor, preacher, teachers in the area, and that's what Paul's rebuking, then why is he telling all women to be quiet and not just them? It doesn't make sense. That argument to try to use an a, a, a imaginary context to remove the, the obvious meaning of the scriptures is evil. Don't let other false teachers convince you of anything other than the plain reading of God's word here, friends. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived first, but she was. And she became the first transgressor. Now, Adam is still a transgressor. That's not being dismissed. The point here is just Eve. Now notice the yet in verse 15. It's a tough verse. I think I understand it thanks to a commentary, uh, a book, good, good book by Wayne Grudem called Evangelical Feminism and Biblical Truth. Don't check it out unless you really like academic reading, but it's good. Here's the idea. Verse 15, let's read it first. Yet she, that is Eve, will be saved through childbearing if they, that is women, Eve's you know, descendants, continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Okay, so Paul's First and foremost, the law of non-contradiction applies in all of life, including Scripture. So God's word does not change nor contradict itself. So God says clearly there is uh, nothing else that saves us but our faith in Jesus Christ. Not our childbearing, not baptism, not your hairdo, not whatever, okay? Um, uh, nothing other than faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ saves so th that's not what Paul's contradicting here, okay? He must mean something else. The yet is the clue here. The yet is the clue. Eve was a sinner or a transgressor. That's his, that's his point in verse 14. The good news is her sin does not condemn her and all of her descendants forever. That's what he's unpacking. Yet she will be saved. And then he gives an example. He could have given a variety of examples. He just gives one example of obedience and that is childbearing in the context of marriage. Now, we know some women will never marry, some women will marry and never be able to have kids. Those are uh, hard cases, they make bad law, okay? And they're just proof of the fall anyways. Paul's talking in principle here. <clears throat> the woman, Eve, and her descendants have not been given the role of teaching, leading, preaching, etc. But they've been given the privilege of childbirth. Something that a man could never even try to do because it's not physically possible. We don't have this stuff. That's Paul's point here. That Eve isn't condemned for all eternity, nor are all women, just because she was the first one deceived into sin. Okay? But rather, she, she'll be saved. Just like any other godly woman would be saved through faith and love and holiness with self-control. In other words, our, our, our faith shows the fruit of love and holiness and self-control. And in the acts of obedience, in the context of marriage, like childbearing. Or in other contexts, context of the church, submissiveness to authority, etc. Paul just uses one example, and it's a weird one for our ears, but that's his point, okay? Not that childbearing saves, but that obedience to your role as a woman or a man shows um, salvation, right? It's the fruit in the tree, so to speak. All right, closing us up here. I'm getting long. Friends, there is a baked complementary nature into our genders from creation on. It's not a result of the fall, it's before the fall. As we have seen time and time again, the Old Testament and New Testaments are clear on this. Equal value, different roles. And different roles make beautiful duets. In the home, in the context of the marriage, the husband is the head or the leader of the home. In the context of that home, in that marriage, the wife is the helper, the one who submits to her husband's leadership and supports it. The husband doesn't get to be the tyrant, and the woman does not get to be the rebel. Husbands, if you've been passive, 
If you've been cowardly in learning God's word or lazy, repent. Make this the year that you grow in God's word. I know one of our elders is is working on some men's breakfast that would help equip us and encourage us in being godly men in our homes and in our jobs and in this church. And men, make no mistake, we need you to lead, not only in your home well, but in this church. We need more men, male leaders stepping up. Not listening to the world's example that all men are, are stupid and bumbling idiots. That seems to be the message of most movies these days is God bless the, 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 the powerful women that listen to the dumb men. That's not the Bible's perspective at all. Step up, men, into leadership humbly with incredible love based on Jesus' model. Sisters, oh, God has given you the incredible privilege of coming alongside your brothers. Now, there's a difference the way that looks with men and women who are single in friendship and obviously marriage, okay? So we've had a lot more application today toward married couples than others. But sisters, single sisters, come alongside your single brothers. Work together in ministry. It doesn't have to lead anywhere beyond that. You can have a godly friendship. You can watch him lead and you can support. And you will grow and sharpen each other. Okay? And in the context of marriage, uh, older wives mentor the younger wives. Please. Alice and I were talking to somebody and, and they gave an example of a ministry that the, the retired women had for the younger wives. And that was this. They would pick like half a day once a month and they would say to this young mom who's just wiped out on babies and diapers and breastfeeding and meals, get out of the house. You, you take four to six hours to yourself. Go get, get a mani, get a pedi, go, go sleep in the bedroom undisturbed, whatever it is. I'm giving you a break. I love you. I will serve your family. They'll be okay. Come back refreshed. Older, retired wives, you can do this. And you can do other things that are better ideas than that. And this isn't my idea. This was some other church that was doing this. I think it was awesome. Maybe that's something that God's calling you to do. To sacrifice a little bit of your time in your retirement to serve the younger moms who you remember what it was like. Think back. You remember just how exhausted you were, how you just hurt all over the place, how you were so tired, you could never catch up. And especially the single mothers in this church, the more people we reach for Christ in this community, the more broken homes we have. And those single mothers need it way more even than the married ones do. So older sisters, come out of the woodwork. Start championing, serving the younger women and helping them. Adopt some. And younger women, reach out to your older moms. The women you see who are godly in the way that they, they, they walk and they talk, they dress and they pray. And start learning from them. Older men, to the men who are my father's age in the 60s, 70s, I need you. And the other men my age need you too. I need you to speak truth into my life. To show me how to do the hard things I don't know how to do. And some of you older men have been that to me. And I want to just commend you. I won't name you by name, but you know who you are. You're the, you're the ones who've come alongside me at my house or helping me with the vehicle or helping me with something I never learned from my old man because he didn't have the knowledge or didn't care to teach it. Thank you. You've meant an immense amount to me. Uh, it just it blessed me immensely. And you can do that for other men here too. They need to learn some of the trades you have. They need to learn how to be patient with their wives. They need to learn how to love their wives, teach their wives, etc. God's word, etc. So older man, if you're retired, you've got time. Spend it well. And finally, church, don't let the culture teach you what to believe about the Bible and about gender. Let the Bible teach you what to believe about culture and gender. Or in other words, find your identity and your salvation in Jesus and in nothing else. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Let me say that again. If any man or woman or child would come after me, let him or her deny himself and take up his or her cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose her life for my sake will save it. But what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words of her will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do ask you to come and come quickly. May we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, and not the words of removal to hell. Not the words that I never knew you. 
Lord, our, your word is, is, is a beacon of light in a dark world. Help us to cling to it like moths. Help us to feed on it and to grow. Call us into greater manhood and womanhood that is biblical. And may this church be a light, a weirder light, so to speak, than our already weird world. A counterculture, a people united though diverse, in love yet submitting. May, may we make a beautiful harmony for you, Jesus. And may you draw others to yourself through us and use us to be your proclaimers of your word, of your gospel, that Jesus saves and that we know it because we, we too were sinners. So do your work in and among us, Jesus, and may you get all the glory for it. In your name we pray, amen. Please receive this benediction from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23 and 24. Peace be to the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. May you go with God's grace this week as you enter your mission field. See you next week, church.